As we gather in worship today, we acknowledge that Calvary United Church stands on Treaty 6 territory, and we pay our respects to our elders, both past and present, wherever we find ourselves this morning. We recommit to our status as an affirming ministry within the United Church of Canada and strive to be an open-minded, inclusive, and welcoming place of worship. It is our deepest hope that all people might feel at home in this space, and we give thanks to God for this Sabbath day, where we join our hearts and minds in prayer. Good morning and welcome to Calvary United Church. We invite you to prepare your hearts and minds for worship. When times are easy or when they are a challenge, we hear the call to join in worship. When our hearts are full of joy or feel heavy with the burdens we carry, we come to this place and lift our prayers. For in this space we find community of faith and we are reminded that we are not alone. In this time we hear the promises of God, words of hope that draw us into harmony with one another and we feed our souls. So come. Let us worship our God of life together.
Good morning and welcome to this last Sunday in August and children's time. How are you this morning? I'm well, but I have a little bit of a confession this morning. It's something that I've been hiding for a long time and I thought it was time to finally come clean to all of you. I am very bad at video games. I know, I know you're all probably laughing at me, but I'm not good at Roblox. I'm not good at Mario. I'm not even very good at Pac-Man. I just find them super, super hard. I've tried a million times and a million ways to try and learn how to play, but it's just difficult for me. And if you run into one of my youth group, you can ask them. They know for a fact that it is. I would show you how bad I am at video games, but that would just be embarrassing for me. What do you find hard to do? Maybe you are in band class and your new instrument's really hard for you to learn. Or another example for me is math. I'm really bad at math. I find it hard. All of it, addition, subtraction, algebra, none of it comes easy to me. Wouldn't it be nice if instead of learning that song on your new instrument, we could just like play a recording over top and you could just pretend and didn't have to learn it? Or... For me, I could just turn on one of those streaming videos of somebody else playing a video game and go, look, I'm so good at this video game. But that's the easy way out. Sometimes the right thing to do isn't always the easiest thing to do. Or another example is how about when you're hiking? Have you ever gone hiking? I have a couple times here in Saskatchewan and in the mountains. And sometimes the trail starts to get really hard and uphill and it's just tough. And you look back and think, hmm, that's a nice bench. I could probably just go sit on that for a while and wait for everybody else to come back. But instead, you slowly start to walk footstep by footstep by footstep. And all of a sudden, you're at the top and it feels amazing. So much better than if you sat back on the bench for a while. So... While we're on the topic of hard things, I thought I'd talk about today's gospel story. It's kind of hard to hear and to think about. It's about Jesus asking his disciples to do hard things and not take the easy way out. In the passage, Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to die soon. That wouldn't be really easy for any of us to hear. Like way harder than finding out that your minister is hopeless at video games. Now, naturally, the disciples, they were sad and upset when they heard this. And Peter, you remember Peter, he was the guy we talked about last week that Jesus renamed and they had the church built on top of him. Yeah, that guy. Peter said, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. He didn't want his friend and his teacher to leave. They'd all been doing such good work teaching people and healing people. Nobody wanted all of that to end. But Jesus replied that he was doing the hard thing, not taking the easy way. Jesus had decided to keep walking the path to Jerusalem and to the parts of the story that we know are coming now. The parts about resurrection and the community, creating a community of love and faith and relationship with him and with God that lasts for thousands of years with you and with me. Even though it would have been easier when his friends were sad and didn't know all those good things were coming to say, okay, instead, let's keep hanging out and keep teaching people. Just like you learning your instrument Instead of playing the recording or me doing my math homework, instead of looking at the back of the textbook, Jesus knew what the right thing to do was. He also, in this story, asked his disciples to come with him, to do hard things with him. And they would one day see that the hard way was the right way. Jesus said to his friends, If any want to be my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. This was, his, I think, his way of saying, leave behind what you know and what you thought before and come with me. Well, that part's kind of easy, right? I mean, we know that the disciples and Jesus, they'd been traveling together already for a long time. But I think what he meant to say was that people coming with him had to forget that 
even the idea of death being a really hard thing. And to remember that God's promise of love is always with them, even when things get really, really hard. It's kind of like looking up the hill when you're hiking. You have to forget that your legs are tired and that you could be back sitting on a bench at the bottom of the hill. Back 2,000 years ago, when Jesus said, take up your cross, it didn't mean the same thing it means today. Today, when we see a cross, like our big cross here, we think of love, we think of faith, we think of God's promise through Jesus. But back then, a cross just meant death. So when Jesus told, told his followers to take up a cross, he get, meant get ready for some really hard things to come. And in the end, it'll all turn out okay. Just like when you finally get to the top of the hill when you're hiking. So I was writing this story and I was kind of feeling like it's really big and hard to think about and maybe a little hard to understand. And that's okay if it is. You can always talk to an adult about it after. You can come and talk to me anytime too. I wanted to finish up our time today with a craft. I spent a long time thinking about what craft we were going to do today too. Something that was hard, but not too hard. Something that was a good symbol of what we were talking about today and on and on and on. I settled on a paper chain. And I'll tell you why I settled on that. Because a long, long, long time ago when I was in kindergarten, I know, a long time ago, like I said, I remember my teacher asking my class and I to make a paper chain. I'm sure it was like one of those little gingerbread men ones or something like that. I can't exactly remember. But I couldn't do it. <laughs> I tried. And I tried, and I tried, and all my friends around me tried and did it, and then they all got to go and play, until I was the very last one sitting at the table, trying and trying. I would make my cuts, I would open it up, and it would fall apart, over and over again. I got so mad and frustrated that my teacher told me it was okay, I could just go play, I didn't have to finish the paper chain. But... I was sad and I was mad and upset and I felt like I just needed to finish it. I just had to do it even though it was hard and it wasn't making any sense to me. I imagine it might have been the same way that the disciples felt that day when Jesus told them and was telling them about the hard things that were going to come. When Jesus said, if any of you want to follow me, he was giving the disciples and the other people following him a choice that they could stay or they could go. Just like when my teacher said that I could stay and finish my craft or I could go play. In the end, I finally got my paper chain made and I got to go and play. I didn't take the easy way out. And you know what? Jesus and the disciples, they didn't either. So today we're going to build a, a paper chain. So all you'll need to gather for this is just a plain white piece of paper or any color that you have on hand, a pencil and some scissors. Okay, so for our craft today, like I said, what we're making is a paper chain. So all you're going to need to do is we're going to need to fold our paper. First, we're going to fold it in half, just the short way, right in half, like so. Make sure that there's a good crease along the edge. Make sure that it's nice and tight. And then you're going to take the top edge and you're going to fold it back so that it meets the other edge of the paper. All right. And then you're going to flip it right over like that. And you're going to take this edge and fold it back. And again, making sure that you have nice creases on each side. And then you can see that you have kind of an accordion. If you want to do more folds, you're welcome to. I'm just going to do four today. The next step of this is you're going to take your pencil and you're going to draw a cross shape on it. Now, your lines don't have to be perfect by any stretch. I'm just doing this freehand myself. But across is a little bit shorter on top and a little bit longer on the bottom. So try and remember that when you're, when you're drawing it. Or at least most of our crosses are. Okay. And so after you're done drawing it, all you want to do is you want to take it and hold it nice and tight. And cut out along your outline. And 
And if you need an adult's help, please go and ask them. I'm sure they'll be happy to help you make a paper chain. All right, and last cut. And there we have it, a nice little paper chain of crosses. When you look at your paper chain of crosses, maybe you'll think about the hard things in life and sometimes them being the right things to do. And maybe you'll think about God's promise to love us no matter what. I invite you to pray with me, friends. This is a prayer I found on faithformationjourneys.org. God, you promise to be with us always. When things are hard or when they're easy, you are there when we feel alone or happy. You are there and thank you for sending Jesus to show us your love and your mercy. Amen. Good morning, I'm Pam Booker and I am doing today's reading in my friend's beautiful yard at Anglin Lake. Today's reading is from Romans chapter 12 verses 9 to 21. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. And persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And this ends today's reading. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every heart be acceptable unto you, O God, our Creator and Redeemer. Amen. So back in 2018, you know, like 40 years ago, we spent a significant amount of time at Calvary talking about what it was like to be a sacred place in a secular world. We discussed ways that the church, like this actual physical building, had the important role of offering sanctuary to anyone who needed it. How life out there was different than life in here. That out there, the rules and expectations were different. That in here, we could exhale, take a break from the wilderness of the secular world, admit what our hearts were truly feeling, find comfort and strength in this community. Here, we could feast on God's word, feast on the bread of life, and then with our souls refreshed, restored, and encouraged, we would return to that secular world, blessed by the sacredness we found here, and boldly live our lives in faithful ways. Last week, as we opened Paul's letter to the Romans, we tried, of course, to change our perspective a little, tried to wrap our minds around what it means to be a living sanctuary. Try to understand that while this physical house, house of prayer is rather unoccupied for the time being, we, you and I, become the sanctuary ourselves. But finding ways to embrace the sacred today seems a bit more difficult than it was a few years ago. More difficult and yet more essential. It was easier when we could come here, build each other up, share the burdens and the joys in real and concrete ways. It's harder now. And yet, it's never been more important. As Cami sang so beautifully last week for us, our prayer for these times really seemed to be, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. 
If you missed her offering, I encourage you to go back, skip past the boring sermon part and just listen to her. It's well worth it. The tricky part, of course, is knowing exactly what being a sanctuary means. When I pray, Lord, prepare me for anything, it's usually because what I'm facing is going to be really hard. Having teenagers living in my house, for example, Lord knows I'm not prepared for that. So if we need God to prepare us to be a sanctuary, then I get the sense it won't come easy. It will be something we need to strive for, work towards, be intentional about, need God's help with. And for Paul, the jumping off point for all of that work is love. Let love be genuine, he wrote. He didn't say, let it be perfect or let it be flawless, just genuine, like we should mean it. Seems like a good way to start about any, to start just about anything, I guess, work, school, relationships. If we can offer genuine love before judgment, well, then maybe things would run a bit more smoothly. So we begin with genuine love. And then Paul goes on to offer a list of activities that should we embrace them would mark us as faithful and Christ-like people. Now, for those of you who know me, you'll know I adore lists. Like, making a list is one of my top 10 favorite things to do. And so for him to give us a list about how to be a living sanctuary, perfect. My heart soars and I jump right in. Hate what is evil, he starts with. Mm, hate's a bit of a strong word, of course, and I'd be hesitant before I labeled anything evil. But if we're going to hate anything, it may as well be evil things. Racism, for example. I know I hate that. Do not lag in zeal. Mm, okay. I mean, I need to look up what zeal means first, but sure, why not? Be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord, persevere in prayer. Well, I pretty much get paid to do all those things, so. Be patient in suffering. Hmm. Bless those who persecute you. Huh. Don't be haughty. Ah. Leave, live peaceably with all. You don't think he actually means like everyone. Here's the thing. This list is beautiful and poetic when we read through it quickly. But when we slow down and let the words seep in, it becomes pretty clear that a lot of this stuff, well, it's really hard. He's asking a lot with this list of his. He's asking that we live in the world differently, that we live each moment as if we were actually in God's sanctuary, that we would live out there the way we live when we're in here. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. That prayer is starting to mean a bit more to me than ever before. I say those words and I feel that in order to be a sanctuary, I need to be brave and open-minded and kind and humble and forgiving and welcoming and patient, and I need God's help with all of those things because goodness knows I can't do any of it alone. And none of it's easy, but all of it seems really important if our society is going to grow and heal and be better than it is, then it's really important. But it's all really, really hard, too. Glennon Doyle wrote, We do hard things because we have hope that in doing them, something better and more desirable will present itself, and the situation that we're in will become better. So we pray for God's help. And then we turn and face this aching and broken world of ours. And when we don't know where to start, well, we start with love. We spread as much love as we can, and when it gets hard, and it will, we take a deep breath and keep going. Because I don't think any of this was meant to be easy. Doyle also wrote in her recent book, Untamed, if you are uncomfortable, in deep pain, angry, yearning, confused, you don't have a problem, you have a life. Being human is not hard because you're doing it wrong. It's hard because you're doing it right. You will never change the fact that being a human is hard. So you must change your idea that it was ever supposed to be easy. 
If we are able to offer ourselves as a place where people feel safe and at home in our presence, where we feast on God's word and bread of life, even when we have to do it seemingly alone, if we can claim sacredness right now, right where we are, right wherever you are, with whatever you are experiencing, right in the middle of a world and a time in history that our great-grandchildren will learn about in school, in the midst of a secularism that feeds on the power of fear and hatred, if we can create sacred spaces in all of this mess, well, then hope is ours. We will live in peace as beloved children of God, holding the light of Christ for one another, living sanctuaries, no matter how hard it gets. In her book, Searching for Sunday, Rachel Held Evans wrote, Imagine if every church became a place where everyone is safe, but no one is comfortable. Imagine if every church became a place where we told one another the truth. We might just create sanctuary. Five months ago, I would have read those words and stopped to think how well we were living them here in this building. Pondered whether we were intentionally working to make people feel safe when they came here, but also studying Christ's words deeply and honestly enough that it made us feel a bit uncomfortable. Jesus came to turn the tables, after all, not tuck us in. But today, I read them and find myself wondering how well I'm living it in my day-to-day -day life. Am I only concerned with my own comfort, my own fears, my own anxieties? Or in the midst of those concerns, am I able to make space for the comfort, fear, and anxieties of those around me? Am I speaking up against injustice? Am I weeping with those who weep? Do I allow other people's joy to feed my own joy rather than allowing their joy to feed my jealousy? Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. May we lift those words that we might walk this road of faith together with courage, with hope, reminding each other that when it gets hard, we can do hard things with God's love as our center. Amen. God of grace, of peace, of hope, our world needs your life-giving presence. We look around and we see at home the ripening fields, we hear the geese, we relish the last of the summer sun. But then we hear on the news how there is so much violence, so much fear, so much anger in the world. May your love fall upon each one of us, that we might all choose to move in ways that are kind. Help our love be genuine in the midst of so much uncertainty. We pray for the thousands of people affected by Hurricane Laura, we pray for those speaking up in the face of racism and injustice. We pray for those affected by COVID-19 and the many ways it is impacting the lives of those we love. And so we pray for those who are lonely, isolated, afraid, as well as those who are sick. We pray for teachers who are getting classrooms ready for their students. It's been nearly six months since the halls fell silent. May you ease their anxiety and fill them with creativity and the ability to adapt. As for the kids, well, may they enjoy their last week of holidays. We pray for those who are in hospital and long-term care. We hold in our hearts all those who are grieving. We long for a day when visits are easy, hugs plentiful, and singing brings comfort. For now, we hope that our prayers are enough. And we lift our own silent prayers to you, God of life. Thankful that we might say to you whatever it is that is on our hearts, knowing you accept us and what we hold without judgment. We give thanks for the generosity of so many people from all across this country who donate to this ministry we share here at Calvary. It is a blessing to share this virtual road together. And so with gratitude in our hearts and the assurance that we are not alone, we say together the ancient words you taught us and we love to hear. Calling you by whichever name feels most like home, we say, our Creator, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We are pilgrims on a journey, fellow travelers on the road. We are here to help each other walk the mile and bear the load. Sister, would me be your servant? Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I might have the grace to let you be my servant too. I will hold the Christ light for you in the night time of your fear. I will hold my hand out to you. Speak the peace you May the power of the one who makes the sun rise be with you. May the light of the one who hears your prayers be with you. May the grace of the one who sets the wind racing be with you. And may the communion of Creator, Christ, and Spirit keep you safe until we meet again. Amen.